and, uh, and welcome to our talk. Today, I'm here, <laughs> and um, I'm one of the first um, core engineers at Mesosphere. And with me, I have Kapil, who's also one of the early engineers at Mesosphere. And we have been recently working on oversubscription and networking and the module subsystem for Mesos. So that's why we're here today. So we are here to talk about books and modules. And we're going to do this in three sections. First off, we're going to talk a little about like, how we came to um, think about modules, why we needed them, why we need a plugin system for Mesos. So basically, just motivating the existence for, for modules. Then a couple will go into the nitty gritty details of how modules work and more importantly, how to write one. So he will give us an awesome demo. And then lastly, mm -hmm. um, we're going to touch upon some of the future developments that we see could happen with Mesos modules, or we could take it further. But first off, um, I want to briefly touch upon um, what modules are, um, how they came to be, and how they can help you and your organization. So if we take a step back and look at how people actually run clusters, hardly anyone runs a large cluster the same way. They have different scales, like running from tens of machines to tens of thousands of machines. They're running on different hardware, on VMs, on EC2, or on bare metal. They're running very, very different workloads. Even people that are running the same web stacks have different um, exhibits different behavior depending on the applications that they're actually running. They will use different tooling, different monitoring systems, and so forth. And they will have very different security needs. It's a very different security need for a, uh, a hedge fund on Wall Street versus um, a startup that just wants to get something running. And in the end, our little astronaut actually wants a, uh, a cluster with turbochargers. That's not something that everyone needs. But good news, Mesos was architected with this in mind. So all the Mesos subsystems are very lightweight, and they expose, actually all Mesos processes expose HTTP endpoints, where you can grab information about um, the current stats and state of, of Mesos, how many tasks that are running, which ones, where they're running, and so forth. And that makes it excellent to tool around, to write a lot of tooling, um, for example, load balancers, service discovery systems. So while this is external, like within Mesos, everything has been written in a very modular way, so you can enable things as, as you need, as you need it. Um, and most notable is when people start a slave, they select um, what isolation mechanisms that they want for that particular setup. But well, all new extensions um, to these subsystems, like isolators, have to be upstreamed. While that's not necessarily a bad thing, I think we could do, we think we could do even better. And we could make Mesos even more cu customizable and extendable. But apart from experimentation, there, this actually supports real business, business needs. Because not all organizations can share how their operations work. And um, yeah, support proprietary um, integrations that cannot be up upstreamed, and just to experiment. So while you can, you can in encourage people to upstream everything that they have, people, people have traditionally just been forking Mesos and have bespoke versions of Mesos which is even worse. So you're not operating within clearly defined APIs. The reason that we got into it was because we actually had a bespoke or very, very particular security need that we needed Mesos to support. We needed to tie into the way um, Mesos launches tasks. We had to set up uh, the execution environments in a dynamic way based on integrations with security subsystems. 
and pass signatures around for all, all the tasks that are, that, that, that are running. And all this had to be transparent for the user and for the framework writers. So while this was one particular thing that we needed and we could have made a fork of Mesos, we thought that this was a bigger problem that we could address with modules. So in the end, we want to be able to extend and replace any component in Mesos, like allocator algorithms, authentication mechanisms, advanced scheduling uh, features like oversubscription that you saw this morning, anything. And I'll ask not wonder if he could write his own um, module. And uh, hopefully the answer to that is yes. However, like modules, as they stand, is, is not a new thing. Like many large software systems um, support libraries that let them extend behavior, isolate and ab abstract and mitigate complexity across uh, well-defined APIs, um, and make um, to set up a configuration exercise ra rather than a build exercise of pull pulling in um, the right sources. Then you can um, select a subset of modules or libraries and, um, and make a setup based on that. And you'll see this in browsers. Um, you'll see this in server software like Apache Web Server. And that's like the way to enable a thing like PHP. You'll even see it in, within the Linux kernel as kernel modules. So what is a, a module anyway? I've been saying module maybe a, a thousand times so far. Um, module, plugin, extension, like library, is kind of a vague definition. But in Mesos, it means to add or replace a full component within Mesos. For example, an isolator. So an isolator is the component that enforces resource isolation of a particular resource type. For example, the CPU isolator. Uh, another example is like the allocator algorithms and the authenticators that sits, sits in the master. So here in this, in this figure, whoops, you see that, if ima imagine this is a meso slave and um, it's composed of the construction of these subsystems, um, we replace full one. But a part of the title was a hook. Um, so what is a hook? Because more often than not, you don't want to re replace a full component. It's really, really hard to write a new allocator, for example. And um, sometimes you just want to tie into the events, like something happened, or just want to change the behavior slightly. And that's, that is what um, a hook, hook is. So for example, we can tie, tie into the launch task request at the master, or the launch task request at the slave, or um, different kind of events, like exit and cleanup events. Um, that's happening around. And here in this example, so the component remains, but calls out into um, your library and say, Psst, I just launched a new task. <coughs> so now you're wondering, like, who's actually using this other than us? Um, it's actually powering a, a new set uh, of pretty exciting features and integrations. Like this morning, you saw oversubscription. And oversubscription is enabled purely by modules. Mesos ships with a pre-built one. It's called the static or the fixed um, resource estimator. But the thing you saw this morning is a dynamic um, estimator and a QS controller. It's called Project Serenity that we've been developing together with Intel. Um, and later on today, um, you'll see network uh, integration with Project Calico that's also enabled with modules. And with that, uh, I will give the word to Kapil. Thanks, Nick. So um, I'm too loud. So this is the end of all the cool clip arts that you were seeing in Nick's talk. Like mine will be much more boring. But uh, what I want to start with is a demo. And I'm quite sure it will work. If it doesn't, then something is wrong with the network or something else. So let's see. So I'm going to start uh, Mesos master here, and then uh, Mesos slave. And here I'm actually specifying a particular test hook uh, to be started with the, the slave. Now the slave is running, master is running, and finally I want to 
launch a test framework. All it does is it actually launches a task and then waits for it to finish up. Now, the hook that we have written will do something uh, strange or something new to the, uh, the task status messages that are coming into the master and the framework. So let's just actually run the uh, framework. So there were five tasks that were launched and they were finished. And now I want to go into the Mesos master and look at state.json and I have added a key and a key value pair where am I mesoscon like where dump but what it is uh, what is happening here is this particular key and value pair has been added by the module that we just uh, added to the slave when we launched the slave. Now we'll uh, start looking into how this whole thing uh, starts from writing the module all the way to where the, uh, the stuff happens in the master and the slave. Okay. So to start with, we have an isolated interface, for example, where you actually uh, define a very, where Mesos defines a very uh, nice API for you to write isolators. So with this isolated interface, you end up writing the isolated module. Similarly, you have other interfaces, let's say a hook interface with which you write a hook module. Usually you would want to put some modules together into a module library and you create another module library with a, a different kind of hook. Okay, so far so good. Now this, these different module libraries and the modules that are uh, contained by them are specified in a JSON file. It's a very simple JSON which says these are the libraries and these are the modules within each other library. And then there are module specific parameters. Next, on the left we have a Mesos master or a slave or the new term agent. The way it's using these, uh, these modules is through uh, a component called module manager. When the, uh, the master or the agent is initializing, it actually goes and asks the module manager to initialize the modules. What module manager will do is, it would read this uh, JSON file that was passed in, will figure out that these are the libraries and the modules that are to be loaded. But notice that it actually is going to just read this information that these are the libraries and the modules that are available that can be used later on. Now once the module manager has initialized, sometime later Mesos will be trying to initialize the subsystems. At which point one of the subsystems will try to use this module that was uh, uh, passed through the JSON file. So it actually asks the module manager to get me a module of this particular type. The module manager will return it a module object the object is of the, uh, of the type isolator interface or the hook interface or whatever interface you implemented uh, for, the, for the module. And finally, you use the, the module object was passed, uh, that was passed in. So in our case, now uh, we had a JSON file which just, create, which just added the uh, hook module. So in this case, when using the module, it just basically calls the hook inside our hook module that was defined in the module library, okay? So what happens during initialization? In the first phase, uh, as we talked about, it actually loads the module libraries using DL open. So it basically is uh, going through the list of module libraries, loading them up, and then looking up some metadata into it to figure out what are the modules available. It also does some sort of uh, compatibility check to see if the module and the uh, Mesos master or agent speak the same language, if they can understand each other or not. And uh, finally, in the second phase, it goes on to initialize specific modules. Uh, that is when the module uh, when the Mesos subsystem is initializing and looking for the, the components. Uh, that is the part where the module specific parameters are also used in. And one of the major difference between the first and second phase is the fact that lib process, the, the actor model is not available while initializing the, the module library because lib process has not been initialized itself. Uh, we also suspect that in, in future we would be able to have a module to modify the behavior of lib process. So this whole mechanism has to be outside of uh, lib process actor model. And in the second phase, of course, you have lib process available so you can create uh, lib process actors and so on. Okay, so we'll actually take a look at the hook module that we uh, used for the demo. It's a very simple module where we uh, inherit from the hook class 
And in this case, we have implemented just one uh, hook. That's the slave task status label decorator. It's a really long name, but all it is doing is it's actually getting called when a new task status message is received by the slave Uh, the author of the uh, module, who should you talk to, what is the simple explanation, and so on. So this was exactly the code that we had in the, in the, uh, in the hook module that we ran. And finally, here is a uh, sample JSON uh, blob. So we have the libraries. We specify the absolute path to the file, or you can just give the library name. Uh, there are the module names, and for each module, notice that there is a, a list of key value parameters that are passed in. So you can use these, uh, these parameters to, 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 to be define the behavior or to modify the behavior of the, the module if it actually is uh, uh, expecting certain things. For example, uh, in case of uh, the network isolator or the Calico, for the Calico uh, we actually specify where is the IPM located, the IP address manager, or what is the binary or the command who actually does isolation? So these things can be uh, defined at runtime dynamically so that you don't have to hardwire these things in the modules. Now, using modules, so there are, the, the building of the modules is fairly straightforward. You can just download, or uh, you can just clone the modules repo, and it doesn't require, it doesn't need you to, um, to compile Mesos source by yourself. As long as you have installed the Mesos uh, developer package, which has the header files and the .so file, it should, you should be good to go. Modules compile into shared libraries, as we have already talked. So you can have multiple modules in a single shared library. That is useful if you want to, say, share data. If the modules are related, they want to talk to each other, and so on. And finally, uh, specifying modules is very simple. Whenever you start a, a Mesos agent, for example, in this case, you can say dash dash modules, the path to the JSON file, which contains all the information, and then that uh, isolation flag that I want to use the isolator, which has been defined in one of those modules, and then a hook, my hook, and that's about it. This will load the, uh, the JSON, uh, the modules specified in the module libraries and make them available for the, uh, the Mesos agent, and the subsystems can then use them as needed. OK, so there are three different kinds of modules. The first one is the replacement module. In this case, we usually replace or uh, add a, a whole new subcomponent inside Mesos, for example, an isolator, an allocator, or authentication mechanism, and so on. Uh, there you have to actually provide a full implementation of the interface that has been defined. and uh, in all these cases, the, uh, the, the module uh, follows this actor model, so you have to be asynchronous. You don't want to block the master or the slave, otherwise bad things can happen. And uh, these are, there is a, a laundry list of uh, module interfaces that is available today, and it actually is uh, growing. And if you have any needs, you can tell us, and we can figure out if we can uh, create a new module type out of it. The second kind is the hook modules. Uh, as we have already seen in an example, we listen for interesting events or intercept things, uh, often we would want to modify the behavior in some way or the other. Uh, in some cases, you just want to uh, listen to the data for, say, accounting purposes or keeping track of what's going on. In some cases, you just want to change the behavior of how the task is being launched and so on. Uh, and it also allows us to tag the, uh, the statuses or the tasks with the information. So in our uh, example module, we tagged the status update message with the key value pair that uh, our module provided. So again, there are two broad categories. One is during the task launch sequence, where you can uh, modify the behavior of how the task is being launched. So you can add labels to the task, so it's like a lightweight metadata, and also uh, set some specific environment variables depending on the needs. 
And the second part is the status updates which are coming from the executor where you can add some more uh, metadata, you can tag them so that the, uh, if you tag them in the slave, you can have a module in master which actually is looking for specific tags and it can take certain actions depending on the uh, specific tags. So anonymous modules. These are one of the most powerful uh, mechanisms here. This basically uh, starts up a lib process actor inside the master or agent, which is running independently, but it's running in the same process, which means it can pretty much access everything. It can uh, create HTTP endpoints. So you can imagine uh, anonymous module which, uh, where you create an endpoint, say slash slash execute, and now you can send some data saying, I want to execute this command, and this module will listen to the, uh, the package that is coming in, and will just run the command on the slave. It's like super powerful, and it, it lets you do pretty much everything, including crashing your master and the slave, of course. And there are no callbacks, because there is no uh, defined interface. It just is the, uh, the, the, the parallel thread of execution running inside the uh, Mesos master or slave. So when you are writing modules, you have to be careful about a few things. Otherwise, you might end up like bringing your cluster down. One of them is do not block. That's the whole model of the, uh, the Mesos architecture. You always use the actor model. You make sure that you don't block. You delegate uh, things to the, the process that is supposed to, uh, if there is something that's supposed to be blocking, then you make sure that it actually is not the main thread that is calling you. And uh, of course, you can use lib process or pthreads or some other mechanism to provide that information. And second, exit semantics. Do not assert, because if you assert, then it means that uh, you are asserting for some tiny thing, but that actually is bringing down the whole slave or the master. We are still working on the exact semantics of how do we want to prevent those things so that as a common module writer, you don't have to worry about these things. But at least right now, the way it exists, do not assert unless you know that it's, it actually is catastrophic. And debugging is, uh, again, in very early stages. You have the logs available. So that's all you should need. But if you need anything more, then you can compile the module, just the module with your debug symbols. And you can run it with the non-debug master or slave. Again, you can use GDB to attach to it. You will have the symbols that you are looking for, but you won't be able to debug master, which you anyways don't want to. Dependency and compatibility. This is uh, yet again uh, one more area which we are still starting to explore. How do you define dependencies between two modules? I have a module A which actually says I can work with module B but not with C. Like, what do you do with that? Uh, the other thing is, can we have two different implementations of the same subsystem in Mesos running at the same time? And the answer is yes and no. For some subsystems like isolators, yes, you can have several isolators. But things like allocators, you probably don't want to have two allocators. And the upgrade path right now it is pretty rigid in the sense that um, the modules, whenever you upgrade a Mesos master or slave, you have to recompile the module with the new master. That's mostly because the API is still developing and it's actually still evolving, so we haven't stabilized yet. But um, that shouldn't uh, be a big deal. And finally, to the future work, and I can actually pretty much speak the whole day. I shouldn't. So one of the important things is security and safety. So you want to be able to safeguard and, uh, um, against um, unsafe modules. One of the things is the module is running as a process, uh, as a, in the same process. So it basically has access to all the data that your uh, Mesos master or slave has, which means it can do really nasty things. One of the possibilities to check that is to run the module in a separate Linux process and have the API uh, or have it talk to the, the Linux process to a very strict set of API using pipes or sockets or something like that. Uh, there is the notion of module certification. So at some point, we should be able to say, uh, yeah, these are the modules which we have actually verified. We have looked into it, or a human has looked into it and has verified that this most likely won't do any harm to you, just like the certifications that we have for uh, browser plugins. ACLs, so I gave an example of the uh, anonymous module where you can maybe run every, anything on the slave, you probably don't want that sort of exposure, uh, and that's where the ACLs come in. You should be restricting that. Uh, again, this is not something that we have implemented yet. Uh, the last thing on this list is runtime functionality check. So uh, one way to block all the unauthorized access would be to see if the, the module, the, the, the request that the module is sending is actually something that we want it to do or not. Like, 
do we want it to add routes or not? Do we want it to add a HTTP endpoint or not? And finally, the real future work, which is not much related to safety. Uh, more module interfaces. We only have uh, six or seven uh, interfaces right now. We want to be able to load and unload modules without rebooting the master or the slave. Right now, if you have to uh, set, Right now, if you have to provide a new set of parameters or a new set of um, modules, you have to kill the existing master or slave and uh, reboot it. Upgrade path is uh, obviously critical. You don't want to keep compiling the modules every time you uh, update your cluster. Uh, the expression of dependability on other modules, again, something which we uh, are still exploring. Intermodule communication is one of my favorite topics. So we have modules in slave and uh, <clears throat> Uh, I gave an example that you can actually put all the modules in a single library and then they can share data. But what if you write a module for master and a slave and you want them to talk somehow, you want to pass some out of band data. Uh, right now there is no mechanism, but uh, there are some leads that we can do, but we haven't actually encountered a, a real use case yet either. Finally, the non-C++ modules. Everyone loves C++, I know that. But sometimes people would want to write a module in Python or something else, and right now the way we do it is by creating a, a C++ shim wrapper. So you create a C++ module which gets the callbacks and then calls into your Python thing. And that's what the project Calico thing is doing as well. You get the isolation call, you look at the parameters, you actually bundle them nicely in a JSON and pass it on to the, uh, the Python binary, and that works. But uh, at some point we would want to have a, a better uh, non-C++ module support. And that's pretty much. Uh, there is a link to the documentation, which is um, uh, in the Apache Mesos uh, website. There's a modules repo where we have some sample modules that you can go and play with. And there's a dedicated mailing list for the modules, mostly because they don't, the, the main mailing list shouldn't be uh, bombarded with the request saying, this module does not work. So thanks. We want to open up for, for Q&A. Um, so this is like an advanced topic um, or advanced track talk. So if you guys had any use cases or anything you want to touch upon with regards to, to Mesos, um, new modules, existing modules, um, any ideas for kind of integrations that you guys could do? Like we could talk about that now. So for, for some modules there, there are, or for some hooks there are like a, a pre and post, right? Yeah. Um, but not, not for all. They haven't been made symmetrical that way. Um, so that's really captured in, um, that's a big header for developing hooks and modules. And we describe for each hook where it actually, where it's been called out. But that's very important, right? For example, in the master, it's after all the task validation um, logic, then you just then call the hook and then send the, the request to the slave. Whereas on the slave, it might be on the entry to some of the functions before setting up the executor environment. Um, but it should be described for each hook in, in, um, in that header. Um, we will we'll get that in a bit more consumable form um, soon. Um, so you mean you, you want to, you have four hooks and you just want to use two and not the other two? Or yeah, I mean, it's very common in the model. It's like, should we Right now, we don't support that. Yeah, um, the, a, lot, a lot of the, the um, the return type of, of the hook is a, is a try or is an option or, or a result. Or so, result. It's so you can give like a, um, you can return an error, um, but does, does it stop the? No, it does not. Yeah. So future improvements. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, for authorization, it is the full module. So you get to do that. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple call where the master says, like, authenticate. And then you get to do all the logic yourself. Um, well, it's a good point. Um, I think we should address it. Shimon? That, that's a really good point. Um, so right now, it's, it's kind of hard coded. It, Mesos goes to like um, proc CPU info, figures out like how many cores, figures out how much memory that's available. Um, that should really be pluggable too. Right? So, you, for example, if you have a system with GP GPUs that needs to go into the resources object, that should be available too. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, we have thought about that, uh, especially in case of networking. So, and the, the general idea is that the isolator interface should be able to tell you what is available and what it can isolate, rather than the user or the operator specifying, like, this is the memory or CPU or the resources. So, yeah. So what? I was wondering um, if modules could be used, for example, to populate custom attributes from the agent uh, in a more dynamic way, because right now, custom attributes have to be yeah. Yeah. So the, the dynamic attributes have we've been talking about that before, even with a slave restart, because the the state of this slave has changed when you add an attribute, and then you actually need to kill all all of its state, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so we do have like um, proof of concept um, implementations of dynamic um, attributes, right? Yeah, so, so yeah, labels you, you could always add, but not to the, to the full slave. But you can add labels to, to tasks um, dynamically if you want. These would be more like put into the offer to mm. the Yeah. Um, so, so um, in my mind, that was labels on everything. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we have labels on status updates now. Yeah. Right? And I could see that labels could go on offers too. Um, but the, the, other, the other situation of dynamic attributes is also really interesting. But it, it requires a bit more work. The first off, there's the dealing with the state, right? And having like, well, the change or the state changed in a way that is compatible um, with, with the new setup. So I, th I think it's, it's mostly. Imagine if you restart your slave and you have few, few resources, but you still have a bunch of tasks running that sums up to more than when you started with. Right. Um, so that, that's something we need to, to address too. Yeah, there is, there is an, an example uh, where the C++ module calls into a Python script. So, there is no first class model, but uh, it's, it's somewhere between a hack and a first class model. So, so we were a bit scared by defining uh, command line APIs that way. So we, we developed a thing called the external containerizer at some point, and that was a, a pretty complicated API um, also, like with keeping certain calls were not returning, they had to stay alive, then you had to check the process. And you, you were in the business of dealing with like process management. Um, so that could be done by people themselves. So they, they write those shims, which is like a one to one mapping of, uh, of the hook calls, like calls of some, some command. Right? Um, in the back. I think it's, it's mostly for vendors. Say so if you have um, like a networking vendor that want to tie in, so you have ways. We come up with the common plumbing and ways to describe, let's say, um, IP assignment and virtual networks and all these things, and needs to be delegated to to another system. Uh, we don't want to be in the business of setting up IP tables or anything like that. 
Um, so if you want, as a vendor, and saying now there's also support for open vSwitch in, in Mesos, that, that could be a way. Um, so it is it's for vendors, for new, new, uh, not new capabilities, but new technologies, and then security. Like, it seems to be that when people want to tie in and call out to different security subsystems, that that's the thing that they could do now. Custom. I think the one thought that we, we've had that was kind of it came up during the, the, the design of modules was to have um, an event bus, like something where everything in Mesos would emit when something is happen, happening, and you can tie into that. So that's kind of, the, I don't know if that's the stream behavior, pipe behavior. I mean, uh, yeah. So our main point where we kind of pushed back was because we needed decorators. So a decorator is one kind of hook, right? So that's why we had like this big gnarly long name. Um, was because for certain certain things, let's say for for a task, you could return a labels object as part of the hook, and that would be added. Actually, it will be overriding the labels that are there. So you you can you can both add and remove labels. Um, we use it to attach different kinds of metadata that would go from the master to the slave, but uh, could not be shown to the user, right? So we had to go in and then strip that metadata from the task before it actually got to the executor. Um, most of the components within Mesos have been written with um, abstract interfaces that makes it very easy to toss a pointer across the library border and then have an implementation. So all the functions are kind of just wired up by the V table. Um, but we need to define the API for all, for all hooks, right? Find good ways, good use cases where, where they go in. Yeah, we, we will have to do that. And it will be, it'll be for one, one allocator. It will be for the hierarchical allocator because it needs to be in line with the code. What I think we could do is we, we could leverage a lot from the process. So already with all our testing infrastructure, we can go in and intercept calls to different actors. So when a certain event is in the inbox and it's about to be executed, um, in the test we can like, stop it, we can um, alter its behavior. So you can imagine something like that. So um, a, an anonymous module like, shows up, it has access to the lib process runtime, then inserts different kind of event callbacks, or it's like, um, it both be for messages coming in or just for events being dispatched. So um, because it's an access system, you should be able to tie into that. Um, I think it's mostly a matter of how much work we had to do, um, because when we had the abstract interface already, it's very easy just to implement it in, in C++. Um, if you have to have a language binding, then for each and every call, you need to tie into this, the C API of that particular language runtime. Um, for Python, it turned out to be a real problem to have more than one module that uses the, the interpreter, because it has a big interpreter lock. Um, that, so yeah. So Go doesn't, can, cannot be dynamically linked. 
So that was the biggest problem for us. We wanted to do it and then took a look at the linker and we're like, oh, we couldn't do it. Um, what we would probably do is to have like a proxy. So uh, we'll have a module like, for each and every call. Maybe, that, maybe automatic um, can call out to another process. Right? Um, so like every single call to this, uh, to this proxy will be sent out. Um, because we have Go support for executors and frameworks. Um, so it has like some notion of interpreting and behaving like a lib process thing. Um, so if, if you have like that barrier where it starts in another process, you have this proxy, um, that, that would work. Uh, it is not. Like, Oh, we're out of time. Uh, we, we can chat afterwards. I um, The thing that ends up under Apache, um, we, do not, we cannot create other repos. Um, so I think there's mostly, long story short, this should be in, in Apache Mesos as an, as an example. But this is where we started working, uh, mostly in term, terms of tooling. Um, but it should be in Apache Mesos. Yeah. Thanks, guys.